Hello, HCC Eagles. Thank you again for joining us for another series of events um, for student life. This week is Financial Literacy Week, and that is exactly what we are bringing to the table and to you all today. So we thank you so much for joining us. So I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, who is Simply awesome. So Ms. Allegra DeLise is a market graduate and the founder of Clear Credit Coaching, our credit repair company that specializes in fast results with a focus on education to empower individuals to use credit to their advantage and take the mystery out of credit cleanup process. She has spent 15 years in financial um, services industry, specializing in mortgages, investing in real estate, flipping properties, and life insurance. She transitioned her career from sales into, hold on one second, just lost it from the bio. Here it is. She transitioned her career into sales in a corporate, um, into sales in corporate America and after five years moved back into the entrepreneurial space with a tech startup company. Miss Allegra is also a writer, primarily focusing on books for melanated children of all ages. She recently self-published her second book, A Journal, A Year of Opulence, which you all will be able to get a chance to get right after she speaks. So just check out the chat for that. Miss Allegra believes in empowering our community through financial wellness and fortifying our children using spirituality to instill value and work ethic. Outside of work, Miss Allegra is an avid world traveler and a proud, proud dog mommy to Coco. She enjoys spending time with her nieces and nephews and planning her next beach getaway. Me too. Allegra's favorite thing about being a consultant is that it allows her the freedom to help people in all areas of their lives from financial guidance to spiritual wellness to bringing their literary masterpieces to life. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Miss Allegra Delise. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hi, you guys. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, just getting to do what I love and talk about what is near and dear to my heart. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit, she gave you my bio, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background and how I ended up in this space so that you can just kind of understand um, really where I come from. So I was um, attending uh, Florida a and University and my sister got really sick. I went back to Milwaukee to give her a kidney and the surgery just kept getting put off. And so we ended up... Um, I basically ended up graduating from Marquette because of just that lag and being there. And during that time, I started flipping houses and doing mortgages. And I was really young. I was like 23 years old. And I was convinced that I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And the market ended up crashing not long after I graduated. Um, at that time, I had eight properties, a Range Rover, a Benz, and a bunch of like credit cards, and it was insane. I lost everything and let it all go. And so what I ended up doing was working really hard. I didn't have any money. So I worked really hard to get everything off my credit myself. And to be able to get like foreclosures and car repossessions and those kinds of things off of a credit report, it takes a certain level of skill and knowledge and understanding. And if you don't have that, then you're just kind of throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. And so I did that for a number of years and I got really, really good at it. And so I began to examine after doing credit repair for a number of years, because a lot of people were in the same boat, I began to examine how I ended up there. And I look back at what I didn't understand about business and what I didn't understand about credit um, that put me in that space. And so whenever I get someone who is a novice in that space or someone who's younger, um, particularly, you know, younger college students, I think about, you know, just the, the initial credit cards that I got just getting on campus. And so all of those things make this my passion where I'm able to share with people um, how they can set their foundation, build their credit and really prepare themselves for a great financial future. And so... With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then we can get started. Um, I'll kind of work through the little presentation and then we'll do some questions and answers at the end. Okay. 
seconds. It's asking me for my password for security reasons. Or it'll let me share. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. So the first thing that's important when you are talking about just like your financial SMART goals, I use SMART goals in almost everything that I do. Um, it's something that I literally wrote a children's book about it to get small children indoctrinated into using it. So as they matriculate, they can understand. So it works really well for almost anything. It works great in the space of finances because when you're looking at making specific goals for your financial future, you want to be really specific about what it is that you're trying to do and where you're trying to go so that you can create a proper roadmap. And so let's say that you intend this, your, your goal, your overarching goal is I want to save some money. And so don't be vague about that. You know, if you want to save $280 a month, that's awesome. But how are you going to do that? So if you're going to be measurable about it, then say like, hey, I'm going to save $70 a week. And then in terms of it being attainable and realistic, those things are kind of, they work hand in hand. And so in terms of attainability, look at what you normally have at the end of the month. Or if you don't have any money at the end of the month or any money before the end of the month, then you need to realign your financial goals and figure out where you can pull it from. So let's say you look at Amazon and you're spending five, $600 a month. I know a lot of us are guilty of getting a package almost every other day. And so if that's something that, even if taking the app off your phone is gonna help you save that money and reach your goal, then be willing to, to make those sacrifices. And so in terms of it being realistic, can you say, okay, I wanna save $1,000 a day. Mm, is that realistic if you don't have $1,000 a day coming in? Probably not. Could you save $1,000 a month or $1,000 a quarter? Yes, that sounds like something that's actually feasible. And that kind of positions you not to set yourself up for failure because the last thing you want to do is give yourself a goal that's unrealistic for you to achieve knowing that you have bills to pay and things to take care of. And then you, you end up feeling bad about yourself for something that was impossible to begin with. And so in terms of time bound, just making sure that you give yourself a realistic um, window within to do it. So if you say, you know, I want to save X, Y, Z amount of money by quarter three or quarter four, then that's reasonable for the time frame that you're working with and for the amount of money that you want to save. So I definitely suggest that you sit down, do your SMART goals for your budgets. Um, you can do it. I recommend doing it for the quarter just so you can see how you did over a three month span. That way, if you make a little mistake or a hiccup or something comes up where your car needs to be repaired, you can rebound and give yourself a, a time frame to look back and say, well, I didn't save the thousand, but I saved 950. So I did pretty good. Or you can surprise yourself and say, well, I saved 1250. And, and how did I do with that? And can I increase my goal for the next next quarter to maybe 1400. So that way you allow yourself to be able to assess that. I would recommend getting one dedicated like composition notebook that's bound because then you can't sneak and rip pages out and then don't remember that you ripped them out. And then you can make your goals in there and really hold yourself accountable for that. So the most important thing, you have to know what's coming in to know what's going out. So I recommend putting yourself on a budget. Every millionaire is going to tell you to pay yourself first. What does that really look like when you have bills and responsibilities? It means even if you put $10 aside for you, put that aside, that that is your money. It's for you, for you to do something for yourself with. So whether you spend it on a movie ticket, go to, you know, buy a new book, grab something extra at Target, or you put it in your savings, whatever you do with this money, make sure you pay yourself first and put it in a separate account. 
um, along with that budgeting piece is living within your means, knowing what you actually can afford, um, looking at you know, the debt that you have and what you're incurring. Are you relying on payday loans? Things like that. So really trying to scale back a bit and make sure that you can afford what it is that you want and what you're doing. Um, in terms of banking, having a good banking relationship with both a credit union and a traditional bank will benefit you in the long run when you're starting to make large financial purchases. The reason for that is that banks and credit unions tend to have different lending standards um, based on credit score, based on your relationship with them. And so depending on what's going on in the market, if you're, the traditional bank isn't giving you what you want, you might be able to go to your credit union and get it. Um, you can also shop for car loans at both of those financial institutions and you can compare credit rating as opposed to going to a consumer agency. So someone that you have a relationship with will likely take better care of you. Um, in terms of building, you know, personal credit, because life insurance is something that I'm a huge advocate of. It is near and dear to my heart. And so anytime I do a financial presentation, I always bring that up because life insurance is a wealth builder. And there are a lot of people who do not understand the concept of how that works because we don't, some people, some communities do not understand the concept of the importance of having life insurance. So specifically, if you are young, if you're between the ages of, you know, 18 and like 35, 40 even, you should be able to get a relatively cheap term policy. So you can go get $250,000 worth of life insurance just to cover your butt in case something happens. A term policy means that it will last for 30 years and then after that, you don't have insurance anymore. However, these are the years of your life where if something happens to you, if you have children you or you have assets that are not paid off, this, this is the time in your life where you have the most to lose and those who depend on you have the most to lose by your income being missing. So you can go get this $250,000 policy if you're in decent health for between 22 and maybe 35 to 40 bucks a month, depending on your age. And if you're a smoker and varying things like that, but it's worth it. You might spend that, you might not even blink that $40 could go to Amazon, it could buy a pair of tennis shoes, whatever, but it's so important for your financial future. And so I always recommend that you get in touch with a great life insurance agent, tell them you're interested in getting just a term policy if that's all you think you can afford at the time, get something and have it come out on auto pay. My life insurance has been coming out on auto pay for so long, I don't even see it, I don't think about it, it just happens. Um, and I know a lot of people are gonna say, well, I have life insurance through my job, I'm fine. The thing about having insurance through your job and being fine is that most people change jobs every two to three years. And in some circles that's recommended because that's how you can maximize your income. When you're outside the space of education and you're in like the corporate world, being able to shift your position usually bumps you up a couple thousand in salary. And then when you shift to the next, even if it's a lateral move, you'll make more money that way. So if you're not staying in a specific position for an extended period of time, when you're in, a, in between jobs or if you start a new one and they say, oh, your, your benefits kick in in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, if something happens to you in that period of time, you don't have any insurance. You also, if you have children, when you have your own policy you, for like a dollar, two dollars, three dollars a month, you can add your child on as a rider and it covers them with between 10 and $25,000 worth of insurance. So for, if something, God forbid, were to happen to your child, they're automatically covered. That doesn't apply with your work policy. So it's always smart, no matter what, to have a policy outside of work. It's super, super important because it protects your family and that's your greatest investment. So that's, I'm a, I've hammered that point home, but I want you guys to know that that's super, super important. So this, and I'll actually email this over to Dominique. Um, it's just a simple little budget that I use because sometimes the idea of a budget can be a little daunting for people. Um, it kind of freaks you out to even think about, like some people just kind of do that fly by night kind of thing, like, well, money's on my debit card, I think, and I'll just like swipe it and pay and, Every, cross my fingers and hope everything's going to be okay. 
Um, in terms of just being able to put it down on paper and being really honest about what you're spending and being able to identify like your, your biggest bills. For a lot of people, they're spending more on childcare than they are on rent um, or their mortgage. So just being able to identify where your money's going is a super important part of building wealth and knowing what you have so you know what you can do, what you can invest, what you can save and what you what choices you're making. And so life insurance is definitely on there as, as an important part of um, your financial plan. So let's talk a little bit about credit mix. So credit is kind of like a dance, if you will. It's it moves, it's a living, breathing entity that shifts over time. It changes with you, with you, your life circumstances, um, what you have going on. And so it's not always, it doesn't come down to just, if I pay my bills on time, I'm good. Or if I don't have any debt, I'm good. Um, the truth of the matter is you want some debt. Um, you want to always pay everything on time that you can and if you have a situation where, let's say you had to choose between, well, I can either pay my current credit card bill on time or I can pay off this old debt and get rid of it. Definitely pay your, on, your, your debt that you currently have, like your, your credit cards, your student loans, if you have any of those yet, which I hope all of y'all are in deferment because you're in school. Um, but things like that, your, your car note, pay that on time. Reason being, as debt, old debt, like if it's an old hospital bill, old cell phone bill, any of that kind of stuff, an old electric bill, whatever, those things die as time goes on. After seven years, it has to come off your credit anyway. If it hasn't, you can petition to remove it. But the most important part of your story is what you're doing right now. So what's going on with you in this particular moment is what creditors are going to be looking at. So even if you have some old stuff where you can write a letter of explanation and say, I made a mistake in the past and this is what happened, um, but now I'm on track and I'm doing really well, that's an understandable situation and lenders will still loan you money for things. So if you want to buy a property, even if you have $2,000 worth of debt just like out there, you can still get a loan with FHA with actually, excuse me, it's $1,999. So I'd rather see you pay your, your car note now and not tank your score than go trying to dig up old debt and pay that off. So that's super, super important. So building and boosting credit. Um, like I said, pay everything on time. Um, diversifying accounts. So if you are... If you have like eight credit cards, that's not really diversified. And so lenders tend to get, and you're trying to buy a house, some lenders can be a little uncomfortable with that. Um, they like seeing a car loan because it says that you can pay for something that has um, a higher dollar amount for an extended period of time. And then it shows that you can be responsible. Um, they do have companies out like rent reporters, which will report the amount of money that you pay for rent every month. That's beneficial. Um, they do have Experian has offered Experian Boost, which lets you um, self-report like your rent and then you could post that on, on your credit report. I will caution you about ex the one thing about Experian Boost is that you give them a little too much information for very little return on top of investment. And what I mean by that is that they ask for all of your banking information that you use whatever account you use to pay that with. And so what happens is they get to see a really good picture of your financial information. They get to, they get an adequate, um, just it, it's too much information to be sharing with a credit bureau. So they get a really accurate look at your debt to income ratio. So if you're in a situation where you debt to income ratio means how much debt you have versus how much income you have. Um, where you, let's say you make 50,000 a year and, but you might make 5,000 a year in your side business where you make jewelry. So if they don't see that in your bank account, when you go to apply for a loan or something, Experian is like, well, you only make 50, you don't make 55. And so they made, it, it creates a little bit of a situation where when they're reporting information on you, they know too much. And then they're only giving you about a 15 point increase for that account. So in my opinion, it's not worth the return on top of investment to use Experian Boost, 
But Rent Reporters is great because it shows that you're paying, you know, six fifty, seven fifty, a thousand fifty, whatever you're paying for rent, and that's really showing as a true and accurate account. And they can go back up to two years, and so that I feel more comfortable with to give you another option. Um, in terms of the important things, it's like paying your bills on time. For credit card balances, keep them under thirty percent. So if you have a card with a thousand dollar limit, don't spend over 300. If you do spend over 300, make sure to pay it off that month. And then if you have anything that's like old negative stuff on your credit report, um, whether it's seven years older or not, um, working to get those things removed from your credit will make your score go up. A charge off of an old credit card or something that's worth like 50 points. Um, a collection is worth about 30 points. So, and of course that, so like, let's say you're at like a, a 500. So, and you get like three of those off that could bump you all the way up to a 650. If you're at like a 750 and you get like an old something off that's like, you know, 50 points, it's not gonna quite bump you to an 800. So the most impactful, you know, when you're removing things is like that sweet spot between five and 600, it'll bump you up about 100, 150 points. So it's worth it to invest in the time or the money, whichever way it works out for you to be able to get those things off. Um, so in terms of your credit, um, I personally am, I'm, I'm a creative. So I'm not the most like organized person when it comes to this date, this is due, this date, that's due. Everything is on auto pay. Like when I tell, if I can put it on auto pay, it's on auto pay, no matter what it is. Like if it's what, it doesn't matter what it is. Like I literally don't wanna have to think about paying anything because if I have to think about it, I might forget or I might be in a different time zone. So if I'm in Bali and I'm just like, that's not where my head is at, I'm on a beach somewhere, I don't wanna think about that. So if you can budget properly, cause you don't wanna create overdrafts for yourself because you, you know what I mean? Um, but if you can budget properly, put everything on auto pay so that it just comes out automatically. Um, and then delete anything that's gonna be a temptation for you that's going to take away from money that's in your account that's geared towards or earmarked for your auto pay payments. So if Amazon is gonna take you out the game, then take that off your phone. So that's my suggestion for that. So let's talk about interest rates a little bit. Um, basically interest is what it costs you to borrow that money. And the higher your interest rate, the more it costs you to buy that money and the longer it'll take you to pay that debt off. And so the key is positioning yourself so that you don't have to be a victim of those high interest rates that cost you more. Those are the people that finance companies love to see coming because they consider you to be desperate and they can charge you more for that desperation. So let's talk about the cost of bad credit and what that looks like. Um, I love this chart because it gives you, I'm a person that needs to see tangible examples. It's really important to me to be like, okay, that makes sense to me because knowing what it really costs you to, to pay for something, um, it kind of really makes you like kind of dig your heels a little deeper and like rely on that delayed gratification and be like, you know what? I can drive my used car a little bit longer that's paid for to not end up in this situation. And so, and I, and I speak from personal experience because when I, when my Range Rover and my Benz got repossessed, I went right back to driving my paid for Ford Explorer. It was a 2004 and I had bought it new and I drove that car until 2015. So I drove it for 10 years and it was good to me. And I, and even when I bought the new car, I was like, ooh, am I ready? And I made sure that my finances were ready. So when I say take the low road until you can take the high road, you take the low road because it'll pay off in the end. Um, so if you've got an auto loan that's $20,000 and the term is five years, 60 months, um, the difference between an interest rate being 26% and 6% is a $212 payment in difference. And so the key though is the interest is $12,000, over $12,000 in, in difference in interest. And so if it's gonna cost you that much over the life of the loan, I promise you it's not gonna kill you to drive that paid for car. Um, the other thing is if you're already in a situation where you're 
you know, where you're paying $600 for your Altima. My advice to you is to do everything that you can to get your credit in a really good space. And if you go back to the beginning where I talked about um, getting a relationship with a credit union or a bank, go back to that bank, that credit union that you have kept your account in good standing with, you know, kept, you know, money in the account and you've had a good relationship with them. Go back to them and say, I want to refinance my car loan and they will do it for you. And then you can put yourself in the other category. So understand that no matter where you are in your credit profile, you can always rebound. You can always fix your mistakes and you can always fix your situation so that it's not costing you to exist or costing you more to exist than it should. So let's talk about that. Um, when you look at bad credit and how that positions you in life, um, employers are pulling credit. So the unfortunate, and even for like promotions and stuff, because if you're like, when I worked in sales, um, you literally could not get promoted to the next level of sales if you had poor credit, because the way they would do it is you had to have a credit card with like a 10 to $15,000 limit in order to entertain customers. And then they would reimburse you for whatever you spent. And if you couldn't like front that money, then that's just how they, that was how they operated. They didn't do corporate cards. And so that's one of the things that you need to think about when you are even applying for positions because having poor credit can push you out of the ranks. And a lot of times they'll either do like a soft pull on your credit where they can see it, but the inquiry doesn't hurt you. So you'll get a letter saying, sorry, we decided to go in another direction and you might've been the more qualified candidate, but this guy over here with the 700 credit score got the position just by default because he had better credit, even if he wasn't the better person for the position. So think about that. Also, when you move into a new place and you go to like pay your, your rent and security deposit. Um, when you, a security deposit in where I currently live, cause I actually just moved to Atlanta. Um, I think the low end was like $200 and that's what I paid. The high end for the security deposit is double the rent. And so on, I'm paying 200 and somebody else could be paying 4,000 for their security deposit, which is obscene, but it's not unheard of. And so, what may seem like normal if your credit score is in the 500 is totally a different ballgame when you're in the 700s. Um, also the same thing for utility bills where they may want to see a $500 deposit, $500 deposit up front to make sure that they're going to get their money. Um, it costs you when you buy a cell phone. So different things like that. So just be mindful of the effect that bad credit can have on you. And that doesn't have to be your normal if you start chipping away at it and working towards um, having better credit and creating goals for yourself. So let's talk about making strategic purposes, purchases um, and shopping with a purpose. So knowing your credit bureaus, um, knowing which ones you're strong in. So here's the thing about credit because every credit bureau is different. Um, they don't all rely on each other for the same information. You could have a significantly higher score with one bureau and a lower one with another. And so what that does is it creates a situation where you get to shop strategically in order to make sure that you get what you need. So if you know that a specific lender is going to be pulling a specific bureau, well, then that's beneficial to you because you'll know like, okay, well, my experience is a 725. So let me find a lender that only pulls experience so that I can get what I'm looking for from them. Or if you happen to know that this particular lender pulls TransUnion and that's your high score, then go with that. Everybody doesn't always pull all three. Why? Because it costs them more to pull all three. So, and Google is a great tool because a lot of times they'll tell like, you know, which one they're most likely to pull or whatever. Um, so that's, that's super important to just be mindful of that and just knowing where you stand. Um, let's talk about credit cards because that is like one of the easiest ways to start building up credit. Um, <coughs> piggybacking is basically when you hop on somebody else's credit card and it's an authorized user situation and then all of their credit information goes on your credit report. So you want to choose someone that is responsible 
that's keeping their balances under 30% and um, that you know that they have paid on time and will continue to. Um, you can go get a secured credit card where you give you know, your bank or whatever financial institution like $250 and then they'll extend a $250 line of credit. Um, and then in terms of limits, generally those first credit cards where you're starting out are like those lower limits, like you might get one for 300 bucks and the interest rate is super high. The key thing there is to just pay it off every month. You might leave $5 on there just so they can make a little interest off of you and it can report to the credit bureau. Put your gym membership on there if you're, you know, if you're able to be back in the gym, you know, COVID and all this. Um, or pay for gas or something that you can either auto pay and, you know, you're automatically going to pay it off. Or if you pay for gas on there and then you pay it off, do something like that. In terms of store credit cards, I always recommend just stay away from them. Whatever they're offering you, that little 10% off today or 20% off today, or you get a free makeup bag or whatever it is, is never worth worth it. Like it, it literally is not worth the dig on your credit report. All you really need is like two to three credit cards max. And those should be with major companies. If you do have a store credit card, don't feel bad about it. Cause sometimes it's like you want a new TV or, and you just, or you just moved and you need furniture or something like that, but make those, those pay, those things that you just pay off. And then you're like done with it and then leave the account open. So that it doesn't negatively affect you because you don't want to go closing accounts unnecessarily either. Cause you want to create credit length and credit depth over time. So secure credit cards are like the slow and steady way to build your credit. Um, they work. It's just a very slow process. And you want to make sure that creating that banking and, and credit union relationship, that you move on from that and that you get a credit card through your financial institution once your score is in a good space. Um, until they abolish student loan debt, come on, Joe, we are waiting <laughs> patiently, like for real. Um, but until that happens, please, please, please make your payments on time. So important. Um, the good thing about student loan debt is like they're super forgiving because they want us to have jobs, right? So all you got to do is call them when you've like made a mistake or missed a payment or whatever. And they'll just like go back into your credit report, report everything is great. And then they'll be like, okay, no problem. Like, like they are the most forgiving, except for Navient. Navient, I've seen them do some, some really dirty stuff to my clients. But other than that, like Great Lakes will work with you. Um, if you have things through your, your school, like directly through your school, they'll work with you. But so yeah, just definitely be on top of your student loan payments. Um, if you get an authorized user, make sure that person protects their credit because it will not benefit you. When I first started rebuilding my credit, I asked my brother to put me on his American Express card. So he put me on his Amex. And then we were having like this casual conversation. He was like, yeah, you know, my money's kind of funny. I think I'm going to max this. So, but I was like, excuse me, what? T take me off that card like now. Like, so I made sure that I got removed before he did something stupid. And so it just shows on my account, on my credit as like a old closed American Express, but it didn't damage my relationship when I went and got an American Express card. So be mindful that the person is protecting their credit. Um, <laughs> getting a car you can afford. So driving something that you paid cash for until you can do something else. Um, getting the Ford or the Kia, as opposed to getting the Benz or the Lexus. Um, and in terms of the affordability in cars, also think about maintenance costs. Um, it costs so much more to repair foreign cars. So if you're not buying new and getting that warranty situation, then think about getting something that's more easily fixable, like a Ford or a Chevy. So that's just, you know, just a note to be, you know, thoughtful when making those large purchases. Um, and then to give you specific examples of just little nuggets of like who pulls what. So like Carvana only pulls Experian. So if your Experian is like shining, then go to them to get a car instead of going to like, instead of going to your credit union, which may pull all three. Um, City Card pulls Equifax, Barclays pulls TransUnion. So these are all some Synchrony Bank, um, they pull TransUnion. So just be mindful of that. Um, when you're shopping, because it'll benefit you in the long run if you're if you're really careful about how you do that and really strategic. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about business credit because I know a lot of people are entrepreneurs. Um, it's kind of just the way of the world right now where we, everybody has like a, a little side business or a side hustle or an aspiration to something that they want to do. So just to kind of get you on the right track to creating a business credit profile and building that up, um, set up your LLC or corporation now. Um, actually go on, and I didn't put this in there, but go on Dun & Brad Street and get a Dun & Brad number, which is like the business credit number. It's kind of like the credit social security number for business. Um, open your business account with your bank, put $1,000 in there and do not touch it for a year. Don't take the money out. You can add to it, but don't take anything away from it. What that does is it creates this business relationship with the bank. And so when your business is doing well and you can show the numbers, um, it also helps you to keep your personal and business finances separate because that gets really, really messy. Um, you'll be able to show what your business is doing and then you'll be able to access funds from them when you want to expand. Um, set, use your SMART goals and set growth goals for your business. Project your weekly earnings because if you, when you're an entrepreneur and whether you're selling you know, waste beads or jewelry or whatever, books, whatever it is, um, project what you think your weekly earnings are going to be and make sure that your product price makes sense. So um, it's funny, I was just watching something on YouTube the other day and this guy was saying how his hats are $100 and they're literally like a baseball cap and they probably cost maybe seven to $10 to make. And he was like, well, y'all will spend that with Fendi or y'all will spend that with this. And it was like, I understand his point of view, um, that whole piece of like knowing your worth, but also understanding that you're not an established brand. So what you're really asking for is for somebody to give you $100 and most of that is the donation. But be realistic about whether that dress or that bracelet that you're selling um, is priced appropriately for the market. And then marketing is key. If you have a business, you have to touch it every day. So the analogy I like to use for that is if you are kicking a soccer ball down a field and then you stop kicking the ball, the ball's not going anywhere. So it's not headed towards the goal. So you're not going to meet your smart goals if you're not touching your business in some way every day. So whether you're making posts on social media, you're revamping something on your web page, you're assessing your prices, you're talking to clients, um, all of these things, you're talking to suppliers, um, seeking new suppliers. Um, so all of these things are important. So make sure that you're constantly um, doing things to, to uplift your business and just putting good energy into it as well is super, super important. And then following the trends. So you know how to pivot in the marketplace. Um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books is Who Moved My Cheese? And it's, um, it's a book on like economic studies and how people react to um, the, climate, the financial climate changing. So there's a block of cheese and there's two rats and they're kind of eating off this cheese every day. And so the one rat, is kind of exploring, going throughout this maze and looking for more cheese. And the other one is just eating the same cheese every day. And once that's gone, he's like, who moved my cheese? Cause he doesn't understand, like you ate it all over time and you didn't seek anything else out. And the other rat has kind of moved on and found another opportunity. And so you always wanna be following trends so that you know, like you can recognize like, this cheese is getting a little, it's getting moldy or it's getting old or it's gone. Um, I think honestly, this, the reason I love this book so much is that the mistakes that I made, um, when the market crashed, I was like, and the advice that I had gotten, I remember my father telling me like, this is not going to last the bubble's going to burst. And I was like, whatever, no, it's going to stay good. It's amazing. And so I was the rat that kept eating the same cheese and did not go looking for more. So don't be me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so now I can definitely take questions um, from you guys and any thoughts that you want to share with me or anything that you want to know. There's plenty of questions on the chat. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. I did not know I was cutting in and out, Jessica. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so term, I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down. Thank you, Daniel, for the first question. Um, term or whole life? So whole life insurance, in my opinion, is better. Uh, well, I won't say it's better. I'll say it's better for a return on top of investment. Um, with a term, with a whole life insurance policy, you can borrow against that policy later if you need to. 
Um, it builds because it builds cash value. The thing is, some people, especially when you're young, when you're a college student, you don't ha always have the money to spend on a, on a whole life policy. So getting a term policy, like I said, to cover your butt is probably the most advantageous. If you have a little bit of extra money that you can invest, getting a whole life policy will give you the greatest return on top of investment over the long haul. Um, okay, so where should you go for life insurance? Ashley Miller, thank you. Um, so here's the thing. It depends on what state you're in because you guys are all in Houston. I'm in Atlanta. I do not have an insurance agent in Houston, but what I will do is I will reach out to my agent and get a referral and I will send that over to Dominique. Um, but yeah, it goes state by state. So I will make a note of that and I will get that over to her today. Okay. And Jared, listen, I need you not to know my life. <laughs> Jared said, I'm always spending more on food than I should. Jared, you're gonna have to start cooking at home, honey. That's, that's, that's pretty much what, what's gonna solve your problem. Um, LaQuisha, name of the website, Clear Credit Coaching. Um, and then, oh, Dun & Bradstreet. Yes, so that's where you're gonna go to get your business credit number. Um, the name of the book is A Year of Opulence. Um, I'm gonna give away one of them today. So um, yes, I'll just pick a number, a random number and I'll just, I'll mail it to that person. Oh, uh, excuse me, Miss, Miss Allegra. I also just wanna let you know about the book. Remember guys, we're gonna be putting a link in the chat. Um, it's gonna be a first come first serve and those first uh, eight people that sign up for the book, Student Life is also gonna mail some of those books out as well so we can um, reach a few more people. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see, should I close credit cards account? I don't use Guadalupe. That is an amazing question. I would not close those accounts. And the reason being, if you pay those off and there's zero balance, they show that you can be responsible, that you paid something off and it ages your credit. So one of the things about um, how credit works is that it's about the depth of credit and the different types of accounts you have, but also the length of credit and how long you've had accounts. So if you close those old accounts, then what happens is your credit looks younger and so it give, it'll it'll ding you and knock your score down. So don't close them, just pay them off and leave it there. Um, okay, uh, Alice said, do you get your money back from a life insurance? Can you cash it out or it disappear? Okay, so if you have a term policy, you don't get anything. There is no cash value built up into a term policy. It just covers you in case something happens to you within a term of 30 years. Um, and like I was saying, those are generally that 30 years is that time frame when you're, you know, you're starting a family, you're raising kids and you have the most liability. Um, after that term, a lot of people like people who, if all your stuff is paid off, it's not necessarily like people, sometimes people don't think like, oh, I'm trying to leave money for someone. They're just like, all my stuff is paid. So what difference does it make? Um, so it's really just kind of that cover your butt policy. If you have a whole life insurance policy, that's where you can borrow money from that policy. Um, okay, Luana Dixon said she can help everyone with insurance. So I always say work with your people. So I will not, Dominique, don't expect a, re a referral from me. Um, please see Luana, um, support your classmates because you know that's how we help each other build wealth. So yes, um, let's see, which bank is best for a savings account? They're pretty much, you know, savings accounts don't give you a whole lot of return on top of your investment. So they're pretty much all about the same. So whichever bank you have a relationship with, um, be mindful of, of overdrafting your account. So that, that's the thing. And if you do have a tendency towards that and you haven't kind of budgeted very carefully yet, open a new account with a new bank that you're committed to having a good relationship with and then have your mess ups with the bank that you're currently with. Because when you're building that financial future and that picture, you want that picture to be as picture perfect as possible with that financial institution. And that can be a bank, a credit union, but I always recommend doing one of each. Um, okay, so Chelsea, you're just getting started. Um, your Wi-Fi bill, could that help to build credit too? Got that on auto pay. 
So here's the thing about this Wi-Fi bill. Um, it's not gonna help you very much. However, um, there's a company that Jay-Z just invested in and they actually will report small bills like your Wi-Fi bill to your credit report. Um, what I would suggest for you, Chelsea, there is a company that, which they'll do that, but actually what I think might be more impactful for you is if you um, go with Self Lender, um, it's where you basically put money into a savings account for yourself. And then they put it on your credit report that you're like putting this money in there every month. And then at the end of a, maybe a year, I think it's 12, a 12 month term, you get the money back. And so they put, they report that account to your credit report. So that would be ideal for someone like you, Chelsea, that doesn't have um, any credit at all. The thing I want you to understand is that having no credit is, is better than having bad credit because it's super easy to build. The other thing that you can do, Chelsea, is you can either piggyback off someone's credit card that has um, good credit, or you can get a secured credit card from your bank. So try those things as well. Um, let's see. Okay, Lawana put her email address in the chat. Um, it's LawanaDixon04 at gmail.com. And she's a licensed insurance agent in Texas, and she will take care of all of your life insurance needs, okay? Um, you're welcome, Alice. Let's see. Okay, so Catrice, um, you said you mentioned Rent Reporter. Is this a specific company? How do we go about utilizing something like that? Yes, Rent Reporters is a specific company. You can Google them. And what you do is you just reach out to them and you say, I pay XYZ for rent. You'll like fill out this little form and then they will contact your landlord um, on your behalf. And the landlord will say, yes, this person does pay that. They pay on time, blah, blah, blah. And they send the information over and then they'll just start reporting it for you. And I believe their fee, I don't know. I believe it's somewhere between either 10 to $24 or something like that. It's a nominal fee. I cannot remember exactly what it is, but it's it's worth it for the benefit to your credit report. Um, okay, Jared, you said, okay, wait, wait, wait. All right, um, can someone type in the book title? They're gonna post the link. Oh, the, the link is in there, Dominique posted it. Um, Jared, you have no credit, where to start? So same thing I said before, um, you can go and get a secured credit card from your bank. You could do self lender. Um, or you could piggyback off of someone else's credit that has good credit. Okay. And Aretha needs, Aretha, the link is right. Oh, let me just copy and paste one second. Oh, Dominique posted it again. Okay, awesome. Um, it's clearcreditcoaching.com. Daniel, sorry. Oh, um, I'm a consultant. And a writer. Okay. Are there any other questions? And if you have like a really personal question, like you don't wanna say like this happened or I did this or you don't wanna tell all your business like I did, then just send me a message on my website and I'll get back with you and, um, and, and kind of give you a, a, a more in-depth explanation um, and just in the chat box, just put, you know, I was in the class today because then I'll answer your question for free instead of charging you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Woo. Okay, supply chain management. Absolutely, Daniel. Um, so Daniel said, I'm in supply chain management major, but worked in finance for about six years. Can I go into something like what you do? Absolutely. Um, find your lane, whatever that is. So if there's something particularly good about what you've done in terms of finance and you wanna consult on that, um, or if there's something about supply chain management that you that really speaks to you, um, figure out what that is. I'm, a, I'm very much so a person who believes in do what you love and the money will follow. And so I would recommend figuring out what that piece is and what you have to offer the world in that space, and then start doing consulting work in that space in terms of like, you know, set up your website and then you can start posting about it on Facebook. Um, word of mouth is huge because once you help one person, it it becomes a chain reaction kind of thing. 
So yes, you definitely can move into, into this space. Okay. Um, yes, clearcreditcoaching.com. Thank you, Dominique. I appreciate it. Okay, Ashley. Hey. Thank you so much, Ms. Allegra. You gave so much great information. I was sitting over here in silence, amen, and in preach into that simply about the whole life insurance deal you know it's because as students and as young people you really never kind of think about that is in terms of what you need especially with planning financially for your family um but i'm so happy that you hit on that because that is something we definitely need to know um but we want to thank you so much for coming and bringing this wealth of knowledge and this wonderful information and then look allowing them to get to pick your brain for free without you charging them um we thank you so much just a, a valuable resource um to our students here at HCC. So Eagles, Ms. Dominique dropped that link in the chat for you to receive your free copy of Ms. Allegra's book. And so that link is in there. Um, if you can go ahead and uh, put it in there, Ms. Dominique just put the link in there. So go ahead and click it. It's gonna be the first eight students will receive a free copy um, um, by Student Life of Ms. Allegra's book. So we thank you all so much for being here with us for the start of Financial um, Awareness Week. We have more to come on tomorrow and Thursday. So you wanna make sure you're coming and listening to these experts in these areas um, that's given this information. So we'll see you tomorrow, Eagles. Thank you guys, have a good one. Thank you, bye-bye.